Welcome back to Mental Math. Here's a question that haunted mathematicians for centuries. Can E, that mysterious constant that shows up everywhere from compound interest to radioactive decay, can it be written as a simple fraction? It seems like it should be possible, right? After all, 2.718 and so on looks pretty ordinary. But here's the twist. It's not. And the proof? It's one of those beautiful arguments where everything clicks into place like a perfect puzzle. Today, we're going to see exactly why E refuses to be tamed by fractions. Our strategy is proof by contradiction. This is a powerful logical tool. We'll assume the opposite of what we want to prove and then show that this assumption leads to an inescapable logical absurdity. Let's begin with our initial assumption, that the number e is rational. What does it mean for a number to be rational? It means it can be expressed as a fraction of two integers. So we can write e as the fraction a over b, where a and b are positive integers. The key to this proof comes from a famous series representation of e discovered by the great mathematician Leonhard Euler. The number e is the sum of the reciprocals of all the factorials. 1 plus 1 over 1 factorial, plus 1 over 2 factorial, and so on, infinitely. Now, we'll combine our assumption with this series. Our goal is to construct an equation where one side must be an integer, while the other side cannot be. We assumed e equals a over b. So we set our fraction equal to the infinite series. To eliminate the fraction on the left and simplify the factorials on the right, we'll multiply both sides of the equation by b factorial. On the left, we have b factorial times a over b. On the right, b factorial multiplies the entire series. Let's first focus on the left-hand side of this equation. It simplifies cleanly. We have b factorial times the quantity a divided by b. By definition, b factorial is the product of all integers from 1 up to b. So we can rewrite b factorial as b times b minus 1 and so on, down to 1. The b in the numerator and the b in the denominator will cancel each other out. This leaves us with a multiplied by the product of integers from 1 up to b minus 1. This product is, by definition, b minus 1 factorial. So the left-hand side simplifies to a times b minus 1 factorial. Since a and b are integers, this entire expression must be an integer. Let's call this integer n. Now for the right-hand side. This is where the contradiction will be revealed. We'll split the series into two parts. We distribute b factorial into the sum, then split the series into two groups, the terms up to n equals b and all terms where n is greater than b. Let's examine this first group. For any term where n is less than or equal to b, b factorial divided by a ni factorial is an integer. Therefore, this entire first part is a sum of integers, which means it must be an integer itself. We'll call it m. Now, let's analyze the second part, the tail of the series. We'll call this part x. Let's write out the first few terms of x. Consider the first term. b plus 1 factorial is simply b plus 1 times b factorial. By expanding the factorials in the denominators, we can see a common factor of b factorial. This allows for significant cancellation in every term. After simplifying, x becomes 1 over b plus 1, plus 1 over the product of b plus 1 and b plus 2, and so on. All these terms are positive, so x must be greater than 0. To find an upper bound, we can compare x to a larger, simpler series. Since b plus 2 is greater than b plus 1, b plus 3 is greater than b plus 1, and so on, each term in x is smaller than the corresponding term in this geometric series. 
The sum of an infinite geometric series can be calculated with the formula a divided by the quantity 1 minus r, where a is the first term and r is the common ratio, provided the absolute value of r is less than 1. In our case, the first term a is 1 over b plus 1, and the common ratio r is also 1 over b plus 1. Let's simplify this expression. We can rewrite 1 as b plus 1 over b plus 1 to get a common denominator. This gives us b plus 1 minus 1 all over b plus 1 in the denominator, which simplifies to b over the quantity b plus 1. Now, the b plus 1 terms in the numerator and denominator cancel out. The sum of the geometric series is exactly 1 over b. So we've shown that our tail, x, is strictly greater than 0 and strictly less than 1 over b. Since b is a positive integer, it must be at least 1. This implies that 1 over b is at most 1. Therefore, x is a value strictly between 0 and 1. This is the critical result. x cannot be an integer. Now, let us assemble the pieces. The contradiction is imminent. Our original equation stated that the left side equals the right side. We proved the left side is an integer, n. We showed the right side is the sum of an integer, m, and our non-integer part, x. If we rearrange this equation to isolate the non-integer part, the logical flaw becomes clear. We can subtract the integer m from the integer n. The difference between two integers must itself be an integer. But our equation claims this integer is equal to x, a value strictly between 0 and 1. This is a logical impossibility. No integer exists between 0 and 1. This contradiction is the punchline of our proof. The only way to resolve this logical absurdity is to conclude that our starting point, our very first assumption, must have been false. Therefore, e cannot be expressed as a fraction of two integers. The number e is irrational. This completes the proof. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this proof, please give it a like and subscribe for more mathematical explorations. See you in the next one.